The following episode contains difficult subject matter and graphic accounts of sexual assault. Please take care. I've driven by this factory on Notre Dame Avenue in Winnipeg probably hundreds of times. Nothing special, just a cluster of buildings, including a warehouse and a showroom. It's looking pretty tired these days. This former Nygaard factory has now shut down after the business's recent financial decline. The Nygaard companies were nearly $50 million in debt to as many as 350 creditors around the world. In March 2020, a judge ordered that the companies be taken out of Nygaard's hands and his properties be put up for sale, including these on Notre Dame Avenue. The real estate photos provide a rare peek inside. Most show a typical industrial space, garages with one of Nygaard's signature Excalibur cars, meeting rooms, and workshops. As I'm scrolling through the photos, I suddenly stop. There are three showing Peter Nygaard's so-called executive suite. A floor of shiny black tiles, a modern kitchen, and a giant bed covered with white sheets. Though I've never been inside, I know this room. It's been written about since the 70s as the Winnipeg home of this playboy businessman. Remember that office bedroom housing a sectional sofa that transformed into a bed? and a panel of switches that locked doors, dimmed lights, and cued romantic music, all under a mirrored ceiling? It's this room. And for April Talek, it's one she'll never forget. That invitation to Winnipeg was a huge turning point in my life. It impacted me in more ways than I thought it could or would. Yeah, it changed my life. Forever. In 1993, April was a 20-year-old aspiring actress and model who was representing Canada at the beauty pageant Miss Asia Pacific Quest. But there was the question as to whose clothes she would wear, who would be her sponsor. As it happened, April had a connection to one of Canada's biggest clothing labels a friend who was related to Peter Nygaard. I was about to travel to the Philippines for the first international competition. They felt like it would be a wonderful idea for a Canadian girl to be representing Canada in every way. And I thought that was a fabulous idea. In November 1993, I got a call from Peter himself and... He said he thought that I would be great as the model for his signature line and that I should come to Winnipeg. April had actually met Peter Nygaard before this phone call while visiting her friend and Nygaard relative in California. During that trip, April stayed at Nygaard's Marina del Rey estate in a self-contained apartment, or what they called then an executive suite. But back then... Nothing bad happened. I arrived in Winnipeg. It was a Thursday night in November. When she arrived for the modeling job, April says she was met at the airport by the friend who had introduced her to Nygaard. We went to one of the factories in Winnipeg where she did some work, and I walked around the factory, and I was in awe of the space. It was an incredible place. Huge She finished her work, and we went to dinner. I was told that I'd be staying in the executive suites in Winnipeg. And to me, that was the same as what is considered the executive suites in Marina del Rey. It's a self-contained apartment. After dinner, we arrived at the Notre Dame warehouse, and it became clear quickly that it was different than what I had anticipated. Peter arrived with his chauffeur, and the first thing he said to me was, wow, you're better than I remember. And initially, I just thought, oh, good. Yay. He's very pleased that I'm going to be doing this modeling for his signature line. I honestly didn't 
I honestly didn't think anything more than that because up to that point in my life, I had never had a professional experience where I felt compromised or taken advantage of. So I was still excited. But April says her friend, Nygaard's relative, soon left and she was alone with Nygaard. And Peter shows me around a little bit throughout this suite and very kind, small talk. And I said, okay, so where will I be sleeping? And where's my suite? And he said, oh, here. And I, no. With you? No. And he said, well, what did you think was going to happen? And I said, uh, I thought I was coming for work. And it was pretty obvious to me at that point that he was expecting more. And I said, I am not going to sleep with you tonight. I will not sleep with you tomorrow. I will. That is never going to happen. When April contacted me with her story, it was a turning point. In the long time I'd been investigating Peter Nygaard, we'd heard rumors there were Canadian victims who were attacked long before he settled in the Bahamas. But April was the first Canadian woman who was willing to put her name out there and say, I believe these women and girls from the Bahamas. Because Nygaard did it to me too. I'm Timothy Sawa, and this is Evil by Design. Episode 4, a Thursday night in November. April Talek is in her 40s now, with long reddish-brown hair. She's sitting in her lush backyard in North Vancouver, which is alive with flowers. She grew up just blocks from here, in a neighborhood she likes to call Pleasantville. April's been an actress for more than 20 years, working in Hollywood and Vancouver. Maybe you spotted her in the TV shows Hell on Wheels or Supernatural. You know, when you have kids, you write kindergarten, what are your wishes, what are your dreams to your child, you know? And all the way from from kindergarten, I think, or maybe even grade one, um, it was always actress and model. She says it feels a little crazy now, but when she was 13 years old, her parents allowed her to travel to Tokyo to live and work as a model. It was a different time. It was extremely safe. There was like 1% crime rate or something like that in Tokyo at the time. And I learned the whole subway system before I even got on the plane, like through the books. And I felt fairly confident. After a while abroad, April's career would take her back home and into beauty pageants, which is how she found herself in Nygaard's orbit and alone with him in that Winnipeg suite. He was very nice to begin with. He was just chatty and kind and, and flattering. And then once I said, uh, I'm not staying here with you, that's not going to happen. I had never compromised myself. I was not going to compromise myself. So I made it very clear. I was not going to stay there with him. And he said, well, what did you think was going to happen? I'll take care of you you take care of me, we take care of each other. And I said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. And it became the cat chasing the mouse really very, very quickly. I went to the bathroom um, and there was a phone in the bathroom and I phoned the airline to ask about getting a flight out that night. And there is no flight from Winnipeg to Vancouver until the Tuesday, the following Tuesday. So I, I didn't quite know what to do, but I went back out into the living room, which there's this bed that comes out. It's this sort of half circle. I'm just sitting there and he starts like actively pursuing me physically. And... I 
no, no, you know, I didn't go hardcore uh, with defense right away because I thought I'll just talk my way out of this. I, you know, I'm a smart girl. I've been in this business my whole life. I can, I can figure out a way to handle this. And I tried with talk and everything. And then he pulled his, he exposed himself and he wanted me to give him oral sex. And I fought with him for a bit. And um, I said, just let me go. Just please. I, I'm just going to leave. I don't need to stay here. I don't want to stay here. I... And he said, I can't let you go. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I can't risk you telling somebody. And I said, I'm not going to tell anybody. That to me, that line, I can't risk you telling anybody, made me so scared that I wasn't going to make it out of there unless maybe I complied. I was terrified of him. So I gave in to... I was pushing him away and stuff, and it didn't end. But I um, turned away and tried to crawl over the couch away from him. And he grabbed me by my hips and pulled me. I kicked him, but I didn't. (sighs) And then he flipped me around and obviously wanted to to have sex with me and I was fighting saying no and I didn't know what would happen if I fought too hard so I just lay there and let it happen April beat herself up for years about the fight she did or didn't put up but she realizes now 30 years later, in those terrifying moments, she was actually paralyzed by previous trauma. I've never told my mother this. When I was 14 years old, I was out with some friends and a boy that I was dating and we had all ended up going to this boy's apartment and we were kissing and he wanted more. And I said, no. And he punched me in the face. (laughs) So so I lay there and let him have sex with me, which is not sex. It was rape. (laughs) So when I was in that situation, in that suite it, with Nygaard, I think that the 14-year-old girl c- came back and she just <laughs> lay there and let it happen. And <sighs> April has had to tell the story of her time in that Winnipeg warehouse a number of times. She says she was held captive for up to two or three days. She knows the doors were locked. She knows she was repeatedly assaulted. But because whole chunks of time are missing from her memory, April believes she was also drugged, slipping in and out of consciousness. I do have flashes of pornography on TV. He played videos of him having sex with women. At one point, an employee came into the suite with food and drink. I don't know why I didn't say anything verbally to this man that came in with the breakfast, but I pleaded with him with my eyes. And I remember being wrapped in a blanket and Nygaard was completely naked, just walking around. And um, I pleaded with this man with my eyes, but I, I didn't ask for help. Then April decides she has to do more. While Nygaard was sleeping, she crept into the bathroom the one with the phone. But the threats Nygaard had made throughout the ordeal came flooding back. He had told me 
all kinds of things. Like, well, I would say, please just let me go. I'm not going to say anything to anybody. I swear to you, I would never. And he would say, you have to be careful because you drive, right? Yeah. It's winter. Your car could just go off the road. April didn't call the police herself. Instead, she called Nygaard's nephew, Chris Nickel, also a friend, who April knew lived in Winnipeg. When I spoke to Chris on the phone, I said, can you phone the police? Chris said to me, you can't phone the police. You cannot call the police. I will come and get you. And I said, I'm in trouble here. I need to get out of here. Can you please do something? I don't know what to do. And there's no way for me to get out. The door is locked with the key. And he said, I'm coming to get you. And I will never forget Chris saying to me, if I have to drive my truck through the glass of the suite, and if every shard of glass falls into my uncle, so be it. But I will get you out of there. So I, I just ended that call and I left the bathroom and very quietly tried to gather what I could gather. I basically put on my coat and I guess I grabbed a purse or something, a bag. I don't recall what it was that I took with me, but I had no shoes. I assumed the door was locked to the suite because it had been locked the entire time that I had been there. And I looked up and I saw the key in the lock. I've held on to this thought for all these years that it was the guy who came in with the food and that he heard me or he felt that I needed help. And he put the key there. I don't know for sure. I don't know. But the key was there. And I opened it. And I got out. And now I'm in this warehouse. And it's night. And it's dark. And then I see the light of a flashlight. And I thought that it was night guard, but it was a security guard. And he says, where are you going? What are you doing? And I don't know how or why I got very calm and very pragmatic with him and sort of bossy and said, I need to leave. And he says, does Mr. Nygaard know you're leaving? I need to call Mr. Nygaard. And I said, he is asleep. Do you want to keep your job? Don't wake that man up. And he listened and he led me to the door and I was out. And I was out in Winnipeg in November, and it was, I remember hearing that it was minus 29 with the wind chill. After a few minutes, Chris pulled up and April climbed in. But April's parents in Vancouver had no idea if she was safe or in danger, and reported her missing. Worried that April hadn't called them after arriving in Winnipeg, which she always did on her work trips, they called the RCMP, and a constable came to their house. While he was there, April's parents finally got a call from their daughter. I told them that I had been in a bad situation, that I had gotten out and I was safe now. And that was basically the extent of it at that point. And I believe it was then that the constable here in Vancouver called and dispatched police officers in Winnipeg who a short time later arrived to Chris's apartment with a social worker. But before they did, she says Chris said it wouldn't help to go to the police. He said he's richer than God, April. He owns the police. He owns everybody. He owns people. Out of fear, April says she never told the police that she'd been raped. I basically said them, I was fine, I was okay. Because I was scared again. And I kept thinking about the story about if it's winter time and when, you know, you could just go off the road. And so I just said, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. April's allegation is disturbing. It's also painfully common. 
because Nygaard is accused of luring many women to his places of business under false pretenses and then assaulting them. And April was far from the first. We went clubbing, a couple girlfriends and myself, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, not all those days, but we loved to dance. It was the sort of ending of the era of disco, but it was fun. It was really not about meeting boys or drinking. It was really about just getting together and dancing all night. It's Winnipeg in 1979, and 17-year-old Casey Allen has recently graduated from high school. Casey was striking. I can say that because I've seen the photos from her modeling days. She was 5'11", blonde, with deep-set dark brown eyes. And there was a sense of fearless certainty about her. You know, I'd grown up overseas with a lot of freedom and with fairly bohemian parents. So, yeah, I had been given a lot of um, headway to go my own way. And, yeah, I had a certain level of confidence in my ability to do things. Living in Winnipeg in the 70s, KC was bound to be a little more worldly than her classmates at the prestigious Balmoral Hall School for Girls. I had a very typical, peaceful, Midwestern, suburban life until I was 10. My parents decided to take our family on a big adventure and we moved to New Zealand. We shipped over our VW bus and we spent close to four years traveling around, camping, and my education at that time was very spotty and it was very interesting and very challenging and then when i was 13 we moved back to winnipeg at 17 casey makes the most of winnipeg's club scene peter nygaard went to a lot of nightclubs and the nightclub we liked to go to my girlfriend and i was called bogart's and he would be there any of the nights all the time that she and i would have been there and it's hard to miss him, and, you know, he was circling. He was sort of um, a shark, buying drinks, checking everybody out, and being very unsubtle about it. Everybody knew who this man was. If you had a daughter at the time, you would have probably wished she would stay away. The Finnish community in Winnipeg knew he was not their stellar member He had started early, and this was his modus operandi. And I guess, you know, it's like all these donators and generous patrons, they're giving away enough money, and they're making Winnipeg look good, and they're being the hometown success story. I used to live in Winnipeg back in the 2000s. It's a prairie Canadian city that often gets a bad rap, known mostly for its bitter winters, hungry mosquitoes, and for being the butt end of several jokes on The Simpsons. That's it! Back to Winnipeg! Okay, sure. The city certainly doesn't have the same cosmopolitan reputation as Vancouver to the west or Toronto to the east. But those who call it home, they like it for its tree-lined neighborhoods with homes middle-class families can still afford and its friendly, laid-back attitude. Having lived in Winnipeg for more than a decade, I remember hearing tons of stories of Nygaard's mistreatment of women, privately. But publicly, he was still celebrated as a business success. And those rumors began long before I moved to town. I would say that uh, he had a level of notoriety, and he enjoyed that level of notoriety. He played that to the hilt. We all knew he was trouble. Today, Casey's recalling her teenage impressions of Nygaard while sitting in the courtyard of a colonial-style house in her adopted home of Savannah, Georgia. He was flamboyant. He was a show-off. He was, by the standards of, you know, the Midwest, he was gauche and nouveau riche. I'm not sure at the age of 17 that I was aware 
he was a predator, but we all knew that he was pushy and bad news and not somebody you really wanted to be seen with or be with. But after one long night of dancing at that favored club, Bogarts, Casey was ready to go home. Her friend wanted to stay. He overheard us talking and offered me a ride, and I accepted a ride home. Rather than driving me home, Peter took me to uh, his office complex. I kept telling him, no, you got to turn left here. Oh, you missed that turn. Here's a good opportunity for you to turn around and go back. And he just disregarded it. And at the time said, I just have to quickly stop by my office to get something. And I don't have any recollection of how from entering the building I ended up. um, And I think it was a few stairs up into his private executive bedroom suite. Casey says she'd been taken to Nygaard's warehouse on Notre Dame Avenue, the same suite where April says she was raped 14 years later. It was a bedroom, but it wasn't because, as I recall, he had a couch that converted somehow. And um, I remember a circular bed, and I remember there being an animal skin, a fur, like a fur bedspread or like a real fur. And um, I was revolted by that. That left an impression on me. I don't remember what happened next other than he threw me on the bed, pinned me using his forearm across my throat, ripped off my underwear. I would have been wearing a dress and raped me with me fighting as hard as I could. And I'm five foot 11, but he's strong and he was practiced at it. It's clear to me that this was not his first time. It wasn't date rape. It wasn't, oh, come on, please, please, please. No, 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 come on, come on. It was full on, fast, brutal, physical rape. I mean, that, I'm a big girl and I struggled, but he was accomplished. He was good at being a rapist. When the attack was over, Casey had no other option but to rely on Nygaard once again. I ended up clothed, my underwear back on, in his car with him driving me home because now we're in the middle of a warehouse district. It's my only way to get home. He did all of the talking. And I had the sense from my memory of that time that he was trying to feel me out, trying to determine the level of risk I posed to him, the level of anger I was harboring, you know, to see what I would do next. But I got home and I went in, it was late. I lived with my parents at the time and I did not tell anybody in my household about what had happened. So the reason I never told my parents at the time was that I truly believed my father would have done something drastic. And I was protecting my dad and my mom. Um, If you tell your father, you have to be prepared that he's gonna wanna do something with that. And I wasn't prepared to put my whole family into turmoil. But she did tell a few people she could trust. I let some of my closest friends know that something had happened to me with him. I did not go into the detail of it, but pretty much everybody in my inner circle was aware that something bad had happened at his hands, at Nygaard's hands, to me. April also couldn't bring herself to reveal the whole story all at once to those closest to her. I didn't tell my parents that I was raped. I told my my sister and my aunt, but... When the constable came to take my statement, once I was home in Vancouver, my parents were doing what they thought was the best thing at the time, and I agreed. And they thought it was best that I didn't press charges because I was just at the beginning of my career as an adult. And Nygaard said at one point, I will ruin you. My dad was so scared that he was going to do something to me or to my family. And and I know that it was because they believed that it was the best choice at the time. But I took that advice and I did not press charges at that time. (laughs) 
After her rape, Casey didn't go to the police either. And soon, she says, she'd be given good reason for not pursuing charges. In January 1980, Nygaard was charged with the rape of an 18-year-old woman in Winnipeg. It was an accusation Nygaard denied. But Casey had been hopeful at the prospect that he would finally go to jail. I felt nothing short of joyful. I felt relieved that he hadn't gotten away with what he did to me. I guess I had been carrying a burden of guilt about not saying something to the authorities, but I was just tremendously thrilled when when somebody stepped up and actually took it to the police. Yeah, I felt vindicated. And I was so thrilled that she had the chutzpah to do what I had not done. And, you know, I was hoping that maybe I would get a chance to testify on her behalf. And I think that it was not going to be heard in court until the spring. It was all over the press. We all knew that he was being charged with rape. So out of the blue, I get a phone call on my parents' landline from Peter Nygaard. Clearly, he was terrified at this point that I was going to contribute to this young woman's case. And Peter offered me money. He said, I don't remember how he did, and it wasn't very subtle, but he offered to, quote unquote, you know, help me with some finances. And he didn't bring up the rape case against him. And when I said, no, I did not want his money, he offered to pay for my college education. And then when I said, no, I did not want his money to pay for my college education, he offered to buy me a new vehicle. And I said no to that too. And I was so offended that he thought I would accept money, you know, or a car. Or, I was just, who do you think I am, you know? To me, him offering me a car, cash, or my college education, verified that he thinks of women as hookers, basically. It's all hooking to him of one type or another. It's just the price tag that's different and the amount of persuasion he has to use. The phone call was a rare opportunity for any survivor, a chance to confront their rapist, uncensored and uninterrupted. But the joy and the beauty of that moment for me was he couldn't hang up on me and I yelled at him for so long I lost my voice. I called him every expletive I know alphabetically. And so I had my day in court, or at least an hour in court with that man, you know, not face to face, but I managed to say to him everything I thought of him and what he had done to me. And I'm very pleased that I had that opportunity, such as it is. It was a victory for Casey, but her hope that Nygaard would see justice was soon crushed. She heard from friends the charge against him was stayed after the alleged victim wouldn't testify in court. She had declined to follow through with her charges, and I just was devastated, just devastated. And I think it kind of supported my worst fear about pointing a finger at a powerful, wealthy man. They have the ability to make such things go away. And it just, it confirmed my worst suspicions about dealing with a man like that. I felt further disinclined to go forward. And I was 18 then, you know, I was not equipped to be the one to stand up and be that person. Nygaard wouldn't face another criminal charge for 40 years. That call to Casey would not be the last time Nygaard got back in touch with a woman accusing him of sexual assault. It's a pattern I've noticed in the years I've reported on Nygaard. In April's case, reaching out came in the form of a delivery to her doorstep in Vancouver. It was just weeks after she says she was held against her will and raped. Nygaard sent a box of clothes to my parents' house, I think, to try and shut me up, which I thought was disgusting. And, I mean, I'm assuming that's what he was trying to do. But I... No, thank you. While April never spoke to Nygaard again, she looked for accountability from someone else. Her friend. The member of Nygaard's family who had left her in that Winnipeg warehouse. Once I was home in Vancouver, I said, how could you do that to me? You set me up. And she said, what do you mean I set you up? And I said, he raped me. He, 
he did all these things and she said, April, I saw the tape. It didn't look like you fought too hard. <laughs> oh God, a fr I can't believe that a woman would say that to another woman. I can't believe that there's a tape. I was so scared of charging him then that it, because it, it could be used against me. Like, that it, I was never a willing participant. Neither of Nygaard's family members involved in April's allegation agreed to be interviewed. But they and Nygaard's lawyer did respond in writing. Jay Prober provided what he says is evidence and testimonies that prove it was impossible for April to have been held captive in the Notre Dame property. He says it was always too busy for her presence to go unnoticed. He went further, claiming April has, quote, jumped on the perceived money train and is a purported actress who is now playing another role. Prober also sent a statement from the Nygaard relative who April says set her up to be raped. In it, she says documentation, like her daughter's school records and immigration paperwork, demonstrates she wasn't in Winnipeg in November of 1993, and therefore couldn't have driven April to the factory. Though she mentions these documents as evidence, she failed to share them. She also says she didn't arrange April's modeling trip, but confirms the trip happened. Nygaard's nephew also confirmed the trip occurred, adding that it had been paid for by the Nygaard company. In Chris Nichols' statement, he said April was fully clothed and composed when he picked her up that night, adding, quote, she certainly made no mention of her having been raped or drugged or locked up or about any misconduct by Peter Nygaard. He claims April said she was there on a modeling assignment and was bored, and that his uncle totally ignored her. He also says that he never told April that his uncle owns the police. April was particularly disappointed in what Chris had to say. I was really sad, actually, if I'm honest, um, about reading Chris's affidavit because uh, I've never said anything negative about him. He, in my mind, saved me. And I know that he is not immersed in the family business. That was really quite heartbreaking to me. But there was clearly no modeling assignment at the end of the day because otherwise, if I was there doing work for them and none of this had happened, I would have done the work. Right. There would have been photos. There would have been stuff documented. And if there was no modeling and they flew you out there, then what happened? And that question is exactly not, right. not being answered by their affidavits. That's right. In a later phone call, the other Nygaard family member, who April had considered a friend, also denied April's allegation that she'd seen a video of the assault. April has since filed a lawsuit against her, accusing her of conspiring with Nygaard and luring April to be raped. It hasn't been proven in court, and the woman denies it all. Nygaard's lawyer, Jay Prober, also disputed Casey's allegation. He then dredged up a defense Nygaard and his representatives have used over and over since his first accusers came forward. That Louis Bacon, Nygaard's former neighbor in the Bahamas, has coached and paid women to lie as part of a vast conspiracy to destroy Nygaard's reputation and business. When April and Casey first heard this defense, they say that's part of what motivated them to come forward. Because there is an obvious flaw in that defense, they told people they were raped long before Lewis Bacon and Nygaard started feuding. We called several of Casey's friends, past and present, to verify this. It checks out. Same with April. I've spoken to that RCMP officer who met with her and her family all of those years ago. He confirms her story. And a friend she told at the time does also. There's so much corroborating evidence. I don't care what his neighbor and he are doing in a pissing contest over the beach. Women don't just come forward and make this stuff up. It's the most painful, ruinous, publicly excruciating accusation to make. 
Casey in April eventually joined a class action lawsuit launched against Nygaard in early 2020. It alleges rape, kidnapping, and sex trafficking. The suit began with mainly Bahamian women, almost all of whom say they were raped while they were minors, some as young as 14. More than 80 women have now come forward to the lawyers. In reading the complaints, it strikes me that he just got better and better and more extreme and uglier and more rampant and more audacious in his attacks. I'm joining this because I want to help the other women. I want to be a spokesperson for other victims. I want justice and I want people to know that it's not a shameful thing to be raped and talk about it publicly. It's not a joy either, but no, I'm just indignant. I'm absolutely indignant. If this were a poor man, he would have been in jail decades ago, decades ago. He is hid in plain sight, making a spectacle of himself and calling himself a playboy. No, he's not a playboy, he's a child abuser. Nygaard's defense that he's been using, uh, saying that all of his victims are tied to his billionaire neighbor in the Bahamas was a huge part of this and my need to come forward also because I have no ties to the Bahamas. I have no ties to that neighbor. I have no ties to anybody that he has used as part of his defense. This was completely separate. So him using that as a defense all the way lo- along, consistently, <laughs> well, what are you going to use now? When I found out that there was this case against him now, and I heard that the victims were as young as they were, and I read the details of the things that he had done to other women, I felt an immense amount of guilt over the fact that I had not charged him at the time and felt like I could have perhaps prevented some of that from happening to other women and girls, children. But I have a 13-year-old daughter. I don't want there to ever be any confusion. I do not feel shame about what happened to me. And that is something that women of sexual assault deal with all the time. We feel that we don't have power, that we don't have voices. And I wanted to give weight to these other people's stories. After we originally reported Casey and April's stories, they told me they were finally ready to go to the police. And they said several other Nygaard victims contacted them after hearing their stories, saying they too would report their assaults. We've confirmed there is now an active criminal investigation in Winnipeg. Casey and April have a shared sense of purpose today, but it's come after many hard years. The trauma of the assaults has stayed with them, affecting their lives in various unanticipated ways. You know, you don't have an opportunity to know what your life would have been like had you not been raped. It's not like it's a controlled laboratory study, Casey without rape, Casey after rape. But in hindsight now, reading what he had done to all those women over the years systematically, it did cause me to reflect on how much choice did I really have after having something like that happen to you. I've had four marriages. I've moved all over the world. I don't know that you can retroactively point the finger at any particular thing in your life as a failure point or a trigger, but it would be very fair to say that I've had trouble feeling safe in any one place or with any one particular man. So for a very long time after I came home from Winnipeg, I had very vivid, very bad dreams. And years later, I was in a long-term committed relationship with a man and I, he would wake me up because I was punching him in my sleep. I was getting physically aggressive in my sleep and in my dream, I was trying to fight with Nygaard and I was always losing. I was always losing. And then one day I won in my dream. Since we first interviewed April and Casey, 
Nygaard was arrested and faces sex trafficking and racketeering charges in the U.S. I followed up with April to see how she was feeling. I'm in shock. I'm in awe. I am super happy right now. But I mean, like I said, I, I don't care how that man goes away. I want him to go away. If he is finally held accountable for what he did to even one of us, if it's not charges that even cover my situation, then I, it doesn't matter to me. I will be happy. It has been far too long that he has been allowed to be free to let this happen to anybody else. So this is pretty exciting. What a wonderful thing to wake up to. Casey wants to know what can be learned now that Peter Nygaard has been exposed. He's been a criminal for four decades at least. And how did that happen? We as a society need to look at this and say, what are we going to do nif- differently with the next monster that comes along? Because there will be another monster. There's always going to be a Weinstein or an Epstein or a Nygaard. But how we learn to deal with it faster and better, or we're just, this is just going to go on and on and on and on. Today, Peter Nygaard sits behind bars, indicted and awaiting trial. Yet the question remains, how did he get away with these alleged crimes for so long? It's been more than 40 years since Casey's rape. With Nygaard's predation dating all the way back to the 1970s in Winnipeg, was there a chance in the decades that followed to stop him before he adopted the Bahamas as his second home? Could the dozens of young women and girls he's accused of raping since then have been spared? Or was the spell he cast over Winnipeg, held in place by the prosperity he offered, too strong to break? Coming up. Definitely people knew who Peter Nygaard was and what Nygaard International meant to the city. People would tell women to stay away from Peter Nygaard. It's so well known in Winnipeg. It's always been known in Winnipeg. What he said essentially was, I'm not going to be the publisher that sends hundreds of Nygaard jobs out of the city. It still affects me making me dirty somehow, making me feel that I should have done something, but I don't know what. If anything you've heard in this episode has left you looking for someone to talk to, please visit cbc.ca slash uncover. We have a number of resources there for those in need of help and support. Evil by Design is a co-production between CBC Podcasts and The Fifth Estate. You can find The Fifth Estate's latest documentary, Peter Nygaard, The Secret Videos, on YouTube. This podcast is written by producer Ashley Mack, associate producer Alina Ghosh, and me, Timothy Sawa, with assistance from Lynette Fortune at The Fifth Estate. Mixing and sound design by Evan Kelly, with technical assistance from Lauda Antonelli. For this episode, special thanks goes to Bob McEwen. Emily Canal is our digital producer. Fact-checking by Emily Mathieu and legal advice from Sean Mormon. Original music by Olivia Pascarelli. Our senior producer at CBC Podcasts is Chris Oak. And our executive producer is Araf Narani. <laughs>